Wonderful. Well, uh, again, everyone, good morning from the East Coast of the United States, and good afternoon to you and your part of the world. Um, this afternoon, uh, we're going to talk about the complexities involved in localizing ARCA OS um, and why uh, it has taken so long for us to get to the point of almost being able to release ARCA OS in non-English languages. So if we can move to the next slide, please. I want to talk for a moment about the gold standard. Um, in an ideal world, everything would be translated so that someone who couldn't speak any English at all, couldn't read any English at all, to whom English was completely unrecognizable, would be able to insert the disk into his or her machine, boot, install, and run the operating system. How close we can get to that is still a matter that's um, up for grabs. But it is what we seek to, to achieve. Next slide. The closer we get to that, the closer we should get to the point where when we make an update to the English version of something, it doesn't cause us to have to go back and rework a lot of things for the other languages, other than adjusting strings that have changed in, in English. Next slide, please. And critically important, the operating system should boot consistently whether it is in English, in German, in French, uh, in Italian, in Spanish, uh, in simplified Chinese or Japanese. The system should boot with the same process no um, noise on the screen, no unrecognizable characters. Um, it should just go through its paces, work its way up to the desktop, and the desktop should be completely translated, all the labels on all of the objects in the selected language um, laid out exactly as they would be in English so that the system is uniform across all of the languages. That's what we seek to achieve. Next slide. Remember, ARCA OS is based on IBM OS2 Warp 452, which is where IBM left off. Uh, our license allows us to distribute code up through the FixPack 5 level on MCP2. That's important to note as we go forward. I'll explain why. Next slide. Of all of the versions of OS2 that were released with Warp 4, by the time we got to the convenience packages, IBM was already thinning the herd and German is the only language that was kept on par with English up through FixPack 5. So all other languages left off somewhere before that. That's important to note also. And again, I'll explain this in more detail as we go forward. Next slide, please. Note how far back some of them some of them go. Um, Warp four fix pack thirteen. There are a lot of changes to the code since Warp four fix pack thirteen. Um, and starting with one of those languages, and having to apply 
code fixes from English Fix Pack 5 and then translate those those new files where IBM didn't provide us with translations adds a tremendous amount to the to the work that's involved in bringing these other languages to um, completion. Next slide, please. Some of them are even worse than that. Some of them go back um, really to pr prior to, to fix pack 13 and they would pose a significant amount of uh, effort for us to do. Now that's not to say that if a customer came to us, a commercial customer and said, we need a thousand licenses for ARCA OS in Catalan. Well, I guess we would, we would look at doing that. That would be su uh, sufficient motivation. Um, as we'll discuss a little bit later on, it's hard to make a commitment like that when the market is unknown. Um, it's difficult to justify asking people to put in hundreds of hours and then finding out that besides the translators themselves, eight other people uh, want licenses in that language. Or I should say, want versions in that language. Because remember, when you have an ARCA OS license, you you may use that license for one installation of any language you like. Next slide, please. Double byte character sets are considerably different than single byte character sets. There are some um, additional DLLs that are required to, um, to, to boot double byte character set languages. Um, a number of additional very, very, very large fonts must be loaded and available at boot time. Otherwise, we just get garbage on the screen. Um, so they pose uh, significant challenges of their own. And some of those, ch those challenges are not uniform um, across all of the languages. So Japanese may pose some issues of its own that are different from traditional Chinese, which are different from simplified ch Chinese, which are in turn different from Korean. So each one needs to be taken as a separate case and addressed individually. Next slide, please. <clears throat> IBM's work was um, not the best it could have been. A lot of times, IBM's work was functional, but not what we would consider done. Next slide. Documentation, and I can understand if, if you don't read English and you need to have a German interface for the application, pressing F1 for help and getting an English help file is not very useful. Um, if you need to read button names and menu items, in your particular language, getting textual help written in English is not going to get you very far. Well, that's what IBM did in a lot of cases. Um, a lot of the supplementary uh, material, the, um, the um, information files that ship with Warp 4, um, were not translated. They were just shipped in English. Next slide, please. WinOS 2, WinOS 2 can be characterized as um, a mess. Um, IBM's method of installing WinOS 2 um, significantly differs from Microsoft's method of installing Windows on DOS. 
and the repackaging caused a lot of odd issues um, and there are a number of parts of the of Wino, the Win OS 2 subsystem in different languages that are more or less translated so you may find um, for instance in the French version that all of the background color choices for the for the Windows desktop are in French and yet you may go to the Spanish version and find that they're in English or you may go to the German version and find that some of them are in German and some of them aren't um, printer names uh, patterns um, all sorts of listings for things were sort of half done um, and don't really match. Uh, in addition, we talk about, as I mentioned before, consistency in booting from one language to the next. WinOS 2 um, schemes, um, background colors, uh, border colors, border thicknesses, can differ from one language to the next. There's no consistency. So this is all work that we would like to address al along the way. But that's just that's just one portion of the operating system. How many people wanting a German version want WinOS 2? I don't know. Who knows? Next slide, please. On top of all of that, Arca OS has a whole bunch of additional third-party components, as well as our own utilities. Um, some of those have translations already. Some of them, the translations are dated to earlier versions. You know, that's the problem with translations, is that if um, version 1.0 of an application is translated into a given language, and that application has been updated to 1.1, 1.2, 2.0, and the translator left off with version 1.0, a lot of that information, those strings, may not match the latest version of the program so they may either be misleading or there may be English placeholders that the developer has inserted in the meantime which of course leads to once again that lack of consistent feeling that lack of polish so these are all things that we need to review and work with the third-party developers to bring their translations current. Next slide, please. Um, ported applications in the um, the uh, the Unix compatibility subsystem. Um, some of them are translated already. For instance, Yum. If you run Yum on a German system, you'll get German messages. Um, in fact, for a lot of Linux stuff, one of the complaints is that there are too many languages and people who only want uh, French end up getting 20 languages installed for something. And so there are uh, tools and many, many, many discussions in public forums about how to remove the excess languages. For us, uh, it's sort of hit or miss. Some of these things have been translated, some haven't. Um, for instance, I'm not sure what languages uh, are included with Perl, whether there are different language packs that are available to be installed. That's more stuff for us to consider. Um, let's move on to the next slide. And some components are really not localizable. So 
for instance, 4OS2 does not lend itself to being translated into non-English languages. The strings are embedded in the code, hard-coded. Uh, they're not read, uh, many of them are not read from separate language files that can be just swapped out um, on demand. Uh, Top is another application, uh, great application. We use it all the time as a process killer. Um, and I talked to Paul about localizing Top and it's just not truly feasible without a major, major, major refactoring of the code. So there are some decisions that need to be made as to how far we go toward that gold standard. Next slide, please. The installer you can think of as one giant one-time use uh, application. And just like the third-party tools, the uh, installer needs to be localized, and all of those localizations that we, all the localizations we have, have been done from scratch. Um, not like we we didn't inherit any of the installer from IBM or any other OS2 distribution. Um, some of our languages, uh, the, not all of the installer pages have been uh, localized. For instance, simplified Chinese, traditional Chinese have not been localized. Um, Korean installer hasn't been localized. Um, the French installer has not yet been localized. Um, other languages, we have very... Um, very current, very workable, very usable translations. Um, the German installer, the Italian installer, the Russian installer, uh, all of those are, are, are done. But it's a lot of work. Next slide, please. So the critical part about the installer is you only get one chance to make a first impression. So even if the operating system is completely translated, but the user has to install it in an English installer, you're not really making a very good first impression. So it's really, really, really important that we get the installer really, really polished in every single language where we intend to release the operating system just for that first impression and remember also for new users, the installer is the most frustrating part of an operating system, any operating system. I don't care whether it's Arca OS, whether it's a Linux distribution, whether it's Windows, or whether it's um, free DOS. Getting through the installer is where you're going to run into most of your roadblocks because you really don't, you, you may not know the operating system at all, and you may not understand uh, when you want to create um, five uh, MBR partitions on a, on a disk um, that you can only have four. So um, the installer is very important. Next slide, please. Just like the installer interface itself, the installer help has to be localized. So all of that um, is additional work that's, that's got to be done. Um, even for our, um, or I should say particularly for languages where the installer interface hasn't been translated, the help really has to be. So if someone doesn't understand what a button means in the installer, it's critical that when he presses for help, he gets understandable help for that button. 
Next slide, please. At boot environments. Now that we have Arca OS 5.1 and we have support for booting um, more than just on, on traditional bio systems, it's complicated all of this. So generally with a traditional BIOS uh, boot, we use the OS2 CSM and Memdisk utilities that were built by Veit Konigieser and are now maintained by Stephen Levine. Next slide, please. Um, we also use the uh, Airboot Boot Manager, which is another piece of third party work. And obviously, all of these things need to be localized. Um, OS2 CSM and Memdisk are generally localized, um, with the exception of some, um, some languages. Uh, but I believe for all of the ones that we're currently building, um, we have messages for those. I don't know that Airboot exists for all of those languages, though. Next slide, please. Once we get into UEFI systems, where we use the Arkanoe compatibility system, ANCS, um, it looks like you've got the same um, the same pre-boot um, environment, but really it's not the same pre-boot environment. It just looks the same. So that work has to be done. Plus, next slide, please. We have the UEFI loader, its boot manager, um, the the boot manager that we that we normally use, AN launcher that is, and system tools. All of those need to be localized. So that's additional work that we wouldn't have if we didn't support that that boot environment. Next slide, please. Both of these environments need to be able to be booted from DVD and ISO if, um, if in a virtual machine, a USB stick. Um, and um, for traditional BIOS, we, we can also boot uh, from, a, from a, an existing partition on an MBR disk. Um, but it essentially doubles the number of potential um, points of failure with our translations, where everything needs to be translated so that whether you boot from DVD, ISO, USB stick, any messages that you might receive in any of those environments are localized for that particular language. Next slide, please. As I said, next slide, please. Double byte character set languages. Once again, they have their own issues. Next slide. So IBM included special input tools um, um, and each language, each double byte character set language allows you to use the, the input utility to, um, to type characters into the, into the system. The utilities vary between languages. It's not one utility. So there's a lot of um, individual stuff that needs to be um, broken out and um, validated for quality control. 
for each separate language. Next slide. WinOS 2 is just um, some of these languages, if, if I'm remembering correctly, we have the option of running WinOS 2 in Japanese or in English on a Japanese system. I may be wrong about that. Um, I know that at least at least one or two of the double by character set languages includes both versions of WinOS 2. Um, Right, exactly, exactly. One is English and one is the other one. And it's just, it's very messy. It's very messy. Next slide, please. As I mentioned before, having those fonts available during boot requires a tremendous amount of memory we try to limit the size of the RAM disk to only um, the space that we need, but the double byte character set languages require so much more space than any other languages that um, they really, uh, let me put it to you this way. It's a good thing that we have this much memory in our machines these days that we can afford to stretch the RAM disk to the size that we're, we're stretching because these fonts are just huge. And when the fonts aren't available, um, it's almost impossible to use the system from a command line, certainly, or to read the messages during boot in case something goes wrong. Next slide. So as you can imagine, um, not all languages are as uh, brief in their verbiage as English. I say Esperanto just as an, as a, as a, an inside joke, really. It's we don't have an Esperanto version of ARCA OS uh, planned. Um, that would be an interesting project. Doing a version of ARCA OS that didn't have an OS2 version in that language would really be a project. Uh, I also joke about doing one in conversational Klingon. Um, talk about having to load fonts. Um, so as I say, the dialogue and input boxes aren't, um, if they're sized for English words, once you use a different language, you can easily run into trouble. Next slide, please. Yeah, that's the kind of trouble you run into. So, um, you know, when you have a 27 syllable word um, in a space that was designed for an English word of four syllables, um, you run out of horizontal room very quickly. Um, and so sometimes these things need to be um, resized, uh, stretched, rearranged, and that is a more difficult process than it actually um, might appear to be because we have to pull the resources out of a compiled file in many instances, make the fixes and then recompile the resources and hope that we didn't overwrite something that was critical um, causing the module to not um, function. Next slide, please. So it's a necessary thing for us to do because again, part of that, that fit and finish is shipping a German version where 
half of the text is running off the edges of the buttons is not what we consider a finished product. So if we have to resize the buttons, and then by resizing the buttons, we find the buttons end up too close together. So we have to stretch the minimum size of the window to accommodate the wider buttons. I mean, it's a um, one problem leads to another, leads to another, leads to another, until you get the whole thing solved. But it's part of it's part of the work. Next slide, please. Ah, uh, the recovery choices menu. Yes, it's a very interesting thing, the recovery choices menu. The recovery choices menu is shown very early in the in the boot cycle. Uh, before the code page statement has been read in from config sys, because remember, when you get to the recover the blue recovery choices menu, you haven't selected a config sys to load yet. So um, there's no uh, code page, or I should say there's no custom code page loaded into the system. IBM decided that 437 would be fine. The problem is there really aren't any accented characters in code page 437. It is not an international code page which means it's not very useful when you are trying to localize the operating system. Uh, next slide, please. So what we have to do is we have to load the extra characters that we need uh, into memory so that they're available when a word on the recovery choices menu requires the display of one such character. It's got to be av uh, available uh, and it's outside the code page. So we have to load that up. And it's sort of like whack-a-mole. So the translator will translate all the text for the recovery choices menu. We run it and we find what characters are missing we add those characters for that language and then rinse and repeat. We have to do the same thing for the next language and the next language and the language after that. Next slide, please. So our general approach to getting all of this gathered together comes back to the the operating uh, system itself. In other words, because ARCA OS English is based on MCP2 fixed pack 5, the goal is to get all NLVs, all national language versions, up to that same code level. That means even if there was no fixed pack 5 released for a given language, we want to update that binary to the fixed pack 5 code level and then apply the translation to that as opposed to shipping essentially old software there's a reason for fixed pack 5 it was to fix things so if we ship something that was from fixed pack 2 it's obviously not fixed Next slide. So we want to address where IBM um, didn't really polish things well. Uh, that takes a lot of time. Um, those uh, untranslated help files from IBM. Ugh. Um, and remember, we don't have sources necessarily for these things. So then you, you talk about um, you know what can we what can we uh, reasonably uh, decompile and recompile in a, a localized format um, so it's it's a lot of tedious work just up, up IBM stuff next slide please <clears throat> 
Fixing Win OS 2 is a, a big ongoing project. Don't expect that when 5.1.1 comes out in any of the additional languages that Win OS 2 will be finished. Win OS 2 is going to take a long time for us to get finally polished off the way we want it. Because it's essentially a, an operating environment unto itself and not very well translated. Next slide. And obviously we want to get as many of the third party components um, localized to the latest level, to the, the level of the component that we are shipping with Arca OS. Next slide, please. Which languages do we intend to release? Well, it's highly speculative. Well, I say entirely on the slide, but we really don't know what the demand is going to be. I mean, we know that there is a demand, a great demand for German. We don't know what the demand is, for instance, for Dutch. We don't know what the demand is for Spanish. We don't know what the demand is for Russian. So we put a lot of work into it. And I say we, I really, really, really should say the translators put a lot of work into it for maybe very little reward. We don't know yet. Next slide. You'd think that since German is already at fix pack five, it would require the least amount of, of effort, but that's not always the case. Uh, when you think about those dialogue boxes, you know, I have to tell you, you people in Germany, you need to do something about that language. You need to shorten some of those words. I'm telling you, um, they, are, they were the butt of many Benny Hill jokes along the way, and for good reason. Words that are that long are just, they just don't lead to good places. They really don't, particularly in software. Um, so we find that even though, for instance, um, French or Spanish may be a little longer than, than English in some places. There's more dialogue box adjustment for German that's required than for those languages. So although German should be farther along the evolutionary scale of the NLV project, things like that hold up the works. Next slide, please. So all things being equal, how do we prioritize the work? That's a big question for us. Next slide, please. We took a smattering of languages. Obviously we started with German. We knew that we were going to do German for a number of reasons. We knew that there was the greatest demand for, for German, um, and German was the closest to English in terms of the, the OS2 code base. So that was definitely going to be on the list. And the other languages we just sort of um, took because they were in pretty much the next group of um of languages to do, the next hardest group of languages to do, that would be Dutch, French, Spanish, Italian. Um, and Russian, we got a, a very active Russian translator and he just really went to town. Uh, Russian was not essentially on our radar at that point, but he was very um, energetic uh, has been very energetic, very responsive, and as a result, we have a 
really fairly complete Russian translation ready to go. Japanese, Korean, simplified Chinese, traditional Chinese. Um, the double by character sets were of interest, so we added them. But they're a lot of work. And again, it's hard to know, for instance, it, would we have a greater market for simplified Chinese than traditional Chinese? I don't know. I don't know what the market is for either one of those. And there are other languages that, that I personally would like to see done, but are even more speculative. For instance, Portuguese. Um, Brazil is an entire country larger than the mother country that speaks Portuguese as the national language and we don't have a version of Arca OS for, for Brazil. Um, we don't have a version of Arca OS for Portugal either, but uh, the idea is that if we had a better grasp of what the demand was, we might um, change some of our approach uh, and and emphasis on one of these other languages um, along the way. Next slide, please. Some languages we just dismissed out of hand. Um, Hebrew, there was no warp for translation, and Hebrew is a right to left language, which poses a whole other set of issues for us. Um, Lithuanian, Ukrainian, our Russian translator also speaks Ukrainian and he asked about doing a Ukrainian version and it just wasn't feasible. That's not to say that if a Ukrainian company were to come to us and say, we have need for a thousand ARCA OS licenses, we wouldn't look at doing Ukrainian. We would certainly, we would certainly have a good look at it. Next slide, please. All of this translation work has been done by volunteers. And I can't stress enough how grateful we are to all of those people for um, volunteering their time and effort and skill to translate ARCA OS um, literally out of the goodness of their hearts. Um, these are very fine people. I have the utmost respect for them, one and all. They have worked very, very, very hard. Um, and sometimes, um, as we'll discuss in, a, in a, an upcoming slide, I, I, I only have a few more slides to go, but sometimes we get done with a component the translators translate it, and then we make a major change to that component, and they have to go back in and redo their work. And I have yet to have anyone really, really uh, say to me, no, I'm not going to do it, because I already finished my work, and I'm not going to do it again. Uh, everyone has been very flexible and understanding in the process. Next slide, please. As I said... Um, halfway in the middle of the translation we make a code change the translation needs to be redone um, sometimes the translation's done and we decide you know what we're really not going to ship that component with ARCA OS so now all that work was for naught now if it's a third party component that someone could download separately that's not wasted effort but if it's an ARCA OS component that we decide not to use and the translators have translated it into a half dozen languages already and completed their work and then we say, you know what? Sorry, we're not using it. Um, it's sort of like wasted time. Um, but sometimes it happens. I mean, we, we, just, we just don't know until we get to that point. 
Um, interesting side note to this, and maybe it's on the next slide. I don't. Uh, I don't know. Um, well, actually, go to the next slide if you would, because that's exactly what I'm talking about. Sometimes the entire components are removed, um, as I said, uh, and. My side note to this was um, the translator started looking at uh, a mouse and started um, cleaning up, updating the the really really outdated translations for the a mouse configuration notebook on the desktop. And David was in the middle of a major rewrite of a mouse. The major rewrite involved changing the way the languages were read into the the um, program. So the whole f the format of the the translations needed to change. And so we had to stop everyone from doing the work and say, no, you got to start over and do it this way now for the new version of a mouse. Everyone's been very flexible. And the second bullet point on that slide, so it's the the next slide. Yeah, they're all volunteers. Next slide, please. So we talked about the gold standard at the beginning of our discussion here. We talked about what it would be in a perfect world. Let's talk for a moment about now that we've been through all of this and all of these different pieces, what is actually possible? Well, it's actually possible for us not to be embarrassed when we release a product. There are two ways that can happen. Not to release the product or release the product when it is no longer embarrassing. <laughs> Next slide, please. Um, if it's halfway done, it's not done. If it's 80% done, it's not done. It needs to be functionally done. It needs to be in a usable state so that people don't get confused when they're trying to use the operating system. If you have a screwdriver and the handle is loose, it's not very useful. You may have a you may have a screwdriver and you may have a handle, but if they don't fit together tightly, you don't really have a workable tool. It's the same thing here. That analogy holds true. Next slide, please. As you know, we take exceptional pride in our work at Arkanoe. We don't release anything if we don't believe in our hearts and minds that it is a finished, serviceable, professional product. So we're not going to do that with a translated version of Arca OS either. It's just not coming. I would rather delay a release than release something that is going to look like a bunch of amateurs did it. That's just not what our company is. That's not, not where we are. And the last slide, please. Does anyone have any questions? Hello, Lewis. Keith here again. Hi, Keith. Um, one of the problems I've had when using uh, or making programs with various languages is basically there are two systems to determine the language. One being the variable set language, you know, then en underscore en. Right. The, the other is the locale. Mm -hmm. And some programs use one, 
some programs use the other. Yes. How are you going to determine with a language version, A, does it use any of these? Does it ignore them? How are you doing it? Um, for our own internal stuff, uh, for our, our for Arkanoe utilities, um, I believe that we uh, we just use the the language the language code and not the locale. Um, but as you say, there are applications that do use the locale, so we have to adapt. So, so that uh, the locale is set correctly, and if there are updates to that application, um, to the to the language of that application, we try not to require a major refactoring of the application. So we respect the way it's set up. Um, but that's that's about all that I can say about it. It hasn't really been an issue because we haven't tried to make everything uniform. We've tried to, to keep all of our stuff in a logical fashion and just allow for changes. Um, there are some other things. Somewhere along the line, for instance, the two-letter code for Japanese changed from JP to JA. So in Vite's work for OS2CSM and um, MemDisk, the languages, the, the Japanese language is coded JP. And if you're building the Japanese version of Arca OS, um, it used to cause issues in our build system because everything was looking for things coded JA. Um, we've made allowances for that, and um, we've, in some in some cases, I don't know that I don't know that we've changed that from JA to JP uh, because I think we already had a workaround in the build system to allow that to uh, to build. So when the the idea came up to change it, um, it was more hassle to change it back to use JA than to leave it at JP and keep our workaround in place. So things like that, are, you know, those are additional bumps in the road, obviously. Um, but we, you know, we try to do the best we can with what we've got. Does that answer your question? It, it does, basically. Okay. Um, I've run into the same problems which you're running into with dialog boxes. Yep. Um, have you considered automatic resizing of the dialogues? Um, I will tell you what my ideas were that you take the largest uh, text string in for example an entry field or what have you work that out and then resize all the boxes accordingly it is no ideal solution, but I wondered if you were looking at that sort of uh, solution yourselves. You know, that falls more under Alex's purview uh, than, than mine, and I don't know um, specifically whether he's looked at that. I'm, I mean, I, I would imagine that he's, uh, he's considered it. Uh, again, <clears throat> working with existing applications, our goal is to make as few code changes as possible. Um, the, the font scalability, of course, has led to the need to make more code changes than uh, we would have liked. Um, but I'm not sure about the, the specific approach that uh, is being taken. Okay, just an idea. Sure, sure, thank you. Could it be Anyone else? Possible to change uh, the general uh, dialog box size because dialog boxes have usually a fixed size which cannot be changed, unlike most other windows, to enforce uh, a resizable uh, way for this dialog. This uh, could be an option if it is possible. 
it it would be it would be great. Remember that um, you know we we have a uh, a fixed um, set of ways of creating um, dialogue boxes on on the the desktop. Um, and so we have to work within that framework that we have. I don't know exactly what's possible in that regard. Um, I'm an engineer, not a not a programmer. So that's uh, again more of a question for Alex than for me. As I think it, if it is possible, it would be a good solution because we have also some people, elderly people, uh, you get uh, sets their font size uh, larger and larger and larger and uh, perhaps the screen uh, if they have a laptop is uh, from the resolution is not that high so uh, mm -hmm. the amount of text that fits physically even if you have the full screen you're using um, on the screen is rather limited <laughs> Probably it would enforce um, like in notebook uh, pages uh, re uh, a pane which uh, has scroll bars if uh, needed and <coughs> also the additional uh, the option to recite the whole thing if it that's if that's possible and probably uh, for a lot of notebook pages from programs uh, it was would already be. Uh, very useful addition to uh, automatically add them or of somehow during uh, the process for those uh, worker share classes. Well, it would certainly be it would certainly be useful again for existing applications. It comes down to how much retrofitting is is reasonable for us to to do. Um, now certainly um, the things that we ship currently with Arca OS um, conform to the or will over time conform to our scalability goals um, but there's a lot of old software out there that is you know if you if you go to the the new Hobbs site and download a program that was written in 1993, um, you know, all bets are off. I have no idea how that's going to render when the user's got his, his uh, desktop font size set to 18 points. I have no idea. And that's not something for us to necessarily address. But these are all good points that you raise, and and if Alex were here, I would put him right in front of the camera in the hot seat, because that's really um, his bailiwick. Anyone else? As I said yesterday, Lewis, I think that anybody should look at his presentation from Phoenix last year, because he highlighted some of the issues yes. and cogwheels that are involved with the dialogues. And I think it also gives us a rough outline that if you write a program for OS2, how you need to set up the font size to prevent it if you set the font size smaller or larger, that you get completely mongled dialogue. So look at that presentation. It's on YouTube. There seem to be no further questions here. So. All right. So let me, let me leave off by saying this. The point of this entire session was to try to bring some perspective to the amount of work that's required just to create another language for the operating system. Uh, even when we have a starting point as close to the English code base as German is, how many other pieces need to come together in order to make a finished product and why it's taken us so long to, to get to that point. So I hope that, that I've at least partially uh, explained that in my uh, session here. And I appreciate everyone's time and
attention. Thank you so much.